I'm uh, J. Paul Morrison. I'm really John Paul Morrison, but I go by Paul. I'm sort of the discoverer. I, I could call it the inventor of flow-based programming, but I think it's more of a discovery process. I worked for IBM for 33 years. Um, I was retired, then I worked for um, a bank for a couple of years. Then I went out as a contractor on my own for about another 10 years or so. And uh, since then I've been consulting, writing, talking to people, interfacing, trying to build up a worldwide community of people who are interested in flow-based programming. And it may be that steam engine time has come, you know. They say when it's time for a steam engine to be invented, it'll pop up all over the place. And uh, so it, it was very much a process of discovery, um, discovering the original idea, but uh, uh, discovering its potential. Uh, it's a paradigm shift. One of the things about flow-based programming is we don't try to control the exact sequence of every event. And that can make some programmers uncomfortable. There are many symptoms of a problem with programming, and I wrote some lines on that quite a few years ago, and I'm not sure that things have improved that much. We, uh, we miss our deadlines, we have budget overruns, we, every so often we read in the newspaper about some computer system which has had massive budget overruns. There's a, an application backlog um, I saw some months ago, some years ago, there was a stat that said something like 80% of the resources in the average IT shop, maybe it's 85, 90%, is going into maintenance. Maintenance is hard because very often it's done by the pe not people who didn't develop the original code. A program is much like clay. It's very malleable when you start, when it's soft. But once it's dry, it's very brittle. So people think, because I can do anything with computers, that means it's always gonna be easy to work with the code and to modify it and maintain it. You don't have a clue what the thing is doing overall. So in fear and trembling, you modify a small piece and you hope you haven't broken anything significant elsewhere in the code. Um, it's a wonder we get stuff. I mean, working in the first place is probably the easy part, but keeping it working. So this application I talked about that's been in production for 40 years, that isn't an application that never changed. That was undergoing constant change. There were changes to the hardware, changes to the software, the uh, surrounding software. There's regulatory changes. There was changes to the laws. There's all of that has to be incorporated. And because it was data flow, because it was uh, flow-based programming, its structure is very obvious, very clear. You can say, oh yeah, I can go into that piece and just change that one piece. And you can be very confident that it's not going to affect other parts of the system. Uh, one thing I want to say about flow-based programming is that now <coughs> we have multiprocessor computers. And Hardly a day goes by without somebody saying, oh, multiprocessor computers are hard to program. Well, flow-based programming uses a multiprocessor computer, uses all the processors, and you don't even have to think about it. It does it in a very natural sort of way, and there's so many different ways to do a particular job. Some people may not feel it's a virtue, but I feel it's a virtue because means you can do tuning, you can move things around, you can change things, you can tweak things, and, and the structure is always visible. That's actually the whole idea that you can put up a chart, and the chart is the program. Somebody once said, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. That ain't true. And there's a guy called Thomas Kuhn, he wrote a book, where he introduced the term paradigm. And he said, paradigm in science not only affects the way you look at the world, but it affects the way you can look at the world. It, it, it affects the very experiments that you do. So you're not going to run experiments that are outside the paradigm. So 
who are the guys who change paradigms? They are usually, I think there's two classes. There's people who come in from left field and have not been brainwashed with the paradigm. And there's people who have been in the field for so long that they start noticing little discrepancies that don't fit in the paradigm. And um, I'm sort of the latter. One of my hot buttons is that a lot of the tools that come out in the industry are oriented towards building a system at the beginning. It's the maintainability that's the real test. It's how easy it is to maintain. For that, you need a simple structure. You need a visible structure. You need clean interfaces and you need components that can be exchanged or moved around easily. You can take a flow-based programming program, an FPP program, and you can carve it up, you can move pieces around because the interface between the components is data. It's not calls, it's not RPCs, it's data. Anything that can talk data is can be part of an FPP system. People who have embraced flow-based programming and, and grok it, they, they can't go back to the old style because it'd be like trying to program with one hand tied between, behind your back. It's the power. It's, it's the enormous sense of satisfaction that it gives you. You can build your program as a diagram, uh, select some components to put in the slots in the diagram, in the boxes, uh, you may find that two-thirds of the components you need already exist. Um, it is a discipline. It's something, it's something that requires training um, to know what components are available and to use the right ones. Um, but I also say that uh, you don't, um, for example, tell an engineer to go build a bridge and just give them a pile of girders. And yet many programming languages, you're given a manual and go to it, you know. So um, a discipline is, to me, involves a, a cycle. Um, somebody innovates a component, you disseminate a knowledge of this component, you build experience with it, and you go back around and innovate again. We don't have that in the programming, conventional programming field. Um, we have all sorts of fancy languages and to me, um, if you can build a system where components talk to each other in a, in a natural sort of way, by way of data, I don't think you even necessarily need fancy programming languages. Um, I've always said that a component should be simple on the outside and I don't really care how complicated it is on the inside. Like, you could say, for example, a spec shouldn't be more than one page of text. You know, if it's got more than that, some people go further than me. Some of the people in the flow-based programming community say, if there's an and in the spec, it's probably too complicated, you know? But uh, componentry, read a file, uh, merge two files, select on such and such a criterion. Uh, an important part of the, of the component idea is you should be able to parameterize the function. And parameterization can vary all the way from none, which is something is so simple that it needs no parameters, to something that is almost a mini language. And so I see the idea of domain-specific languages as fitting in very well in this. I should be able to build my application out of components, and I want to build those components in whatever language is appropriate for that component. This is a point that we've talked about, which is the lack of good tools in the programming field. And I think partly that's due to it, the fact that historically it had this text orientation, uh, you basically, no matter what the design was, even if the design was done in stone, 
you eventually had to turn it into lines of text. The very first implementations of flow-based programming, we did our charts on humongous pieces of paper. You stick it up on the wall, and then you annotate it, and you mark it up, and you rub out, erase the blocks, and move them around, and draw new ones, and after a while, the surface of the paper is totally sort of soft, you know, but it's still in use, and then people would put little jokes and cartoons on there. There's another one of my hot buttons is, is documentation. Uh, you know the old phrase, uh, if it was hard to write, it should be hard to read. A document uh, uh, of, a, of a program, of an application, is no use if it's done once and then never maintained. And under the pressure of developing code, people don't basically have time to develop a documentation. So with, with these approaches, um, the document is the code, the code is the document. I think that's definitely the way we, we should be going and, uh, and it looks like it's starting to take off.